Hey guys, welcome back to We Watch Movie. I am Mike, and today we are reviewing, with spoilers, Wolf Creek 2. We just did Wolf Creek, the first one, a couple weeks ago, as promised that I would watch 2 and do a review for that as well. So many of you guys in the comments were like, you gotta watch 2, dude, it's gonna fuck you up, man. And many, many people told me, they said, hey, this is better than the first one. Now, the first one's always the more inspired one, it was the original idea, but I feel like this movie, that movie walked so this movie could run for sure. So because the first movie starts out so slow and you spend so much time with these people going on their, you know, the, the dude who's definitely a, a, an extra in an alien ant farm video and his friend's journey, and it takes so long to get into the darkness of the movie, this movie is able to subvert that expectation from the very get-go. So you're, you're watching John Gerard, who once again just absolutely fucking crushes this. The guy's... The way that he can go from maniacal psychopath to just disgusting piece of shit that you hate to in between be charismatic and almost likable when he wants to be, when he's putting on that sociopathic sheen, is really, really impressive. The guy crushes in these movies. There's no doubt about it. It opens up with him driving down the road and he gets pulled over by these cops with nothing to do except for put their pinkies in their butts. And I don't know why specifically that was. And you know what? I hope that they didn't have flame and hot cheetos before they did it because that sounds like it would get itchy but my point is this they pull them over and the cops are super dicks and we all know we're all we all know they're like you guys you're fucking with the wrong sancho man if you're edge because i'm wheezing on your grind it's just chill so don't tax my gig so hardcore cruster the cops have no idea who they're messing with and they mess with him and then give him a ticket and he's like you sure you won't do that mate and they're huge dicks, and they go drive away, and they're laughing at themselves, proud of themselves for being basically the shitty, mean version of Super Troopers, and you know what's coming. And it's so cool, because they're just driving down the road, and you're just waiting for that pew <laughs> from that bullet. And when it comes, it comes hard, uh, and it explodes the driver's whole head off. And the special effects, and the gore, and the practical effects are just fucking top notch man like that that was amazing the way it just like slanted off of his head and how goopy and gross it looked it was amazingly done and the other cops freaking out and his death was gnarly too because he takes the real asshole cop and does the old head on a stick which you remember from the first ones when he severs your spine so basically you're just a head on a stick you can't move and sets the dude back in the car and then it's fucking with him, smacking in his face. The guy, this is where it starts to get really depraved because the guy starts crying. He's like, I want to see my kids. And you actually feel terrible for him. And then he doesn't care at all. And he pours the gasoline all on his face, like on his wounds. He pours the gasoline all over him, lights the thing on fire, and the movie starts. And you're like, God damn. Not not what the, not last guy didn't get. Last guy didn't get, what movie is that from? Comment down below. Uh, you got, you big, we small. Awesome opening for the movie, especially if you are into these kind of movies. Some people will be like, that was just mean and disgusting and I wanna go home, but take me by fucking Dairy Queen first, you piece of shit, I want a banana split. This is where they start to continue to subvert expectations, which was pretty cool. We're introduced to this couple, this foreign couple, and uh, you thinking, oh, I know what you're gonna do now. Last summer, you're gonna take us through their backpacking, and they show us like their romance and their journey and their all this and and like you're like oh man how long are you gonna do this to us wolf creek to fuck because you're like there's two people we know they're gonna get tortured and murdered but first we know we're gonna have to watch like their goddamn when harry met jack and sally shit through the through the forest through the through the australian outback and it worked in the first film because it set it up and it made you care about those characters i get that but you don't really want that in the second one as well it's just too much um nothingness going on there they do it for a little bit just for a touch just enough to trick you a little bit but then they're in a campsite and he shows up and there's a really freaky scene before that where they almost get picked up by him and he's sitting there waiting but this other truck comes so he just drives away and there's a running theme throughout the movie about obviously about tourisms about australians about kind of territorialism and how no no one he's at one point he says you know you forgot the first rule mate never stop for anyone or whatever and they're, they're getting mad at people for not picking them up and i'm like dude you're the one who decided to spend your fucking vacation with your sweaty ass crack walking around in the middle of fucking nowhere like that's that's the shittiest vacation i can imagine Ooh, adventure and ponds fucking it's no one's responsibility to give you a goddamn ride, you fucking hippie. Now take this mechanical asshole and get it off my fucking street! 
the guy's actually like, no, we're good. We're going to stay here until morning. We don't, we don't need any help. And then he gets offended quickly. And the one thing the movie's missing is it was kind of really fucked up in the first movie, how charismatic he was and how he would really let your guard down by just like pretending he was a good dude. They don't really waste a lot of time with that in this one. Uh, and I get that, but it does somehow make it a little less freaky in a weird way. He immediately, the guy turns his, he's like, don't you turn your back on me, you fuck. And he severs his spine. He does the head on his thick thing to him again. And then he goes and gets the girl and things are getting really fucked up now. Because he's all like, I wasn't going to fucking do you right here. But now I got to. And then he puts it. I'm so sorry for my awful Australian accents. I can't help myself. But he ties her up or whatever. Uses the knife and the zip ties. And he's clearly going to rape her. And there's this awful fucking quote where he pulls down her pants. He's like, hey, cookies. And I don't know what the fuck that means. But no thank you, John Jim Jefferson the second. I was like, oh, God, please don't do it. And then suddenly the boyfriend's okay. Like, he gets up. So I guess he severed the wrong nerve or something. But they have a quick fight scene. Gotta admire the guy's fight. He puts up a good fight. And he slits his throat, cuts his head off in front of her. And she's a great actress in this scene because she just looks like... Whatever was here is now gone. She has left the fucking building, as you would if you watched someone do that to someone. Uh, and he even mentioned, he's like, you, you and I are going to have like months to play together. And you're like, oh, God damn it. It's not even going to be over quick. But she wakes up and he's cutting up her boyfriend, like just cutting him up, putting him in the back of the truck. And he cuts off his dingling. And he's like, oh, look at that. Lucky girl. Eh? <laughs> he throws in the thing. That's how fucked up it is. They're showing him holding like a severed wiener, which any movie that shows a severed wiener is going to go hard. And this one does. But she uses that opportunity to escape. And again, the guy dies quicker than you expect. And you're like, oh man, it's just her. Like, how long are we going to go on? Is he, are we going to have to watch him have his way with her? I hope not. And then all of a sudden, new character shows up. And it's this new fucking guy played by Ryan Core, who's awesome. The actor's so fucking good in this movie. Like, I think it's really underrated the performance that Ryan Core gives in this film. He was just, he, that movie asked a lot of him. He had to be witty. He had to be fucking Axon Jackson. He had to be scared. He had to be maniacal uh, once things start happening to him. The, the movie asked a lot of this guy and I just thought he crushed it. Way better of an acting performance than you usually expect in these movies uh, as far as torture porn and stuff goes. But that goes top to bottom with the Wolf Creek movies so far, I've noticed. between From John Gerrott uh, to, to, to Ryan Cora, it's just really good acting. So he helps her. She gets in the car. She doesn't speak his language. So he has no idea what the fuck is going on, which would scare the bejesus tits out of you. Uh, she's just screaming, covered in blood in this giant truck, which they use the truck and make it a character in the movie, sort of like the Jeepers Creepers wagon in a really good way. Uh, it's, it's pretty freaky, actually, just the way those giant lights come on. So he's chasing them. There's an awesome chase scene that happens between these two cars in the middle of the and they use the outback again it's it's kind of like the ocean in the middle of the night i had no idea i was that afraid of the outback country side just making the scenery a character in the movie so he chases them all through and in this fucked up crazy moment he goes to shoot him and he misses and he hits the girl the dude's in the car and he moves his head and the bullet just blows her face up so you're like oh my god i thought these were our main characters they're dead we're not even halfway through the movie yet and it's just this one dude in him so again they use the first movie to really subvert your expectations in some awesome ways so the chase is on between these two and it is a fun chase to watch because the way that they filmed this oh, oh but first the fucking kangaroos mate i forgot about the kangaroos crazy shit the way they filmed these scenes was so cool the, like the, they look like fucking like 4k gopros or something it, it didn't I, when i say gopros that makes it sound bad but just the angles they used it's all filmed practically it's all done old school it's just fucking beautiful man uh, and really just action jacks and fun to watch the way they do these chase scenes. They just feel so realistic. The only thing that they did use CGI for in this scene was the kangaroos because a fucking pack of kangaroos comes running out and the dude has to dodge them because there's like tons of them just going through the middle of the road, right? And he's in this giant semi truck and he's just mowing them down in like the meanest way. Like there's just kangaroo after kangaroo under his fucking tires, just guts going everywhere. And then he has the film's best one-liner. He's like, welcome to Australia, cocksucker. <laughs> As he's mowing him down. And it's great. But he pins this dude against the in the truck in, in the Jeep against this thing and knocks him off. And the way they shot that scene was so realistic. You felt 
it was like 3D. I mean, you felt like you were in that car holding that steering wheel as you're going off a ravine and into just like death town. And just the way it was filmed was really scary. It's probably the scariest moment of the movie, to be honest with you, because you felt like you were in that Jeep. And the airbags come out, and he survives. And then he's like, yeah, it's, it's going to take more than that to kill me. I feel pretty fucking all right, dude. And then the next thing you know, he looks up, and Mick Taylor drives the entire... He got out of it, but he throws the entire semi-truck off. So then the semi-truck comes flying and explodes in the middle of the outback right there. And it's just a dope-ass scene. He lets him go, because he's all the way up here, and he's all the way down there. And you just know he's somewhere lurking at all times, which is pretty freaky to feel. The dude almost dies from being out in the in the sun in the desert or whatever, but he finds a house and he passes out on the house's door. And you're thinking it's gonna be fucking Mick Taylor's house, isn't it? God damn it, I knew it. Just don't go bungee jumping in Mexico, all right? They just don't have the regulations. Movie that from come down below. And it's this sweet elderly couple who are creepy as shit and definitely smell like baloney. But they're like, eh, we don't have a phone. Uh, sometimes the TV doesn't even work. Uh, out here, you just kind of got to make it work. And they're like, but we made you a special meal. And it's like fucking celery and carrots and water and like bread. And I'm like, that's your special meal. What are you eating on like Tuesdays? Because I know you don't have fucking tacos. Cobb. Not not even corn, just just cob. <laughs> Couldn't afford the corn, so we just ate the cob. Anyways, you don't trust these people. It feels weird. And and just the creepiest you're never gonna escape feeling moment ever. He just begins to get comfortable and eat his carrot soup. And then all of a sudden you just hear from outside the house Mick Taylor's voice like, Hey, you don't want anyone else to get hurt, do you? Come on out. And you're like, fuck. You just feel violated and unsafe. When am I gonna escape these fucking tuition payments he just murders the shit out of these elderly people in the saddest way possible and they were both really good actors in the roles and the movie's so fucked up and twisted that when he chases the old woman down the hall and like shoots her in the back he walks up to her and you're like oh fuck he's gonna rape her isn't he god damn it they're gonna make us watch it aren't they oh fuck they're gonna put a gopro on him and make us watch him raping this they don't he just goes too bad you know i could have had some fun and shoots her in the face um, so you're like, oh, thank God. That's, <laughs> that's all he shot her in the face with. And then, then there's another chase scene where he gets on a horse and the dude's just out in the middle of the nowhere, just hiding behind bushes and shit. And he gets on a fucking horse with a flashlight and it's just tense as shit. Cause like, you know, he's going to find him. And then he does. And, and Ryan Kors character is just like, oh, would you fucking leave me alone, mate? And then he knocks him out, takes him back to his dungeon. And this is where we spend the rest of the movie. Maybe spend a little bit too long there. I don't know, just a little bit. But they are, it's just, just this straight up, pretty much interrogation scene, only he's just fucking with him the entire time. And the things that he says in there, it's weird. Like he starts to quiz him, and then you find out that this character's really, really smart. And he's like a, a, a huge history buff, and he knows all the answers to his questions. Because his whole thing is like, you know, you thought you'd come in my fucking country. He's a xenophobe. And he's like, you thought you'd come to my fucking country and, you know, shit in my backyard, eh? And like, he's all pissed about that because he really hates tourists. But he calls him all these fucking, you know, I'm actually afraid to say what he calls him because I don't know what it means. And I don't want it to be like a racial slur that I'm just going to get canceled for saying. But if you've seen the movie, you know, it's a, it's a P word and a C word. A cunt is the second word. The first one. I don't know what it fucking means, man. But this scene goes on and on. He's like, I'm going to ask you 10 questions. And every time you get one wrong, I'm going to cut off your finger with this and saw and not only does he cut it off but he puts it in one of those things that squishes and, and you can hear his bones breaking and then he saws off the finger but the dude's actually doing good and he's getting some of them right after they sing the kangaroo song tommy down sport kangaroo tommy down kangaroo sport and they do this for a while and then the dude starts trying to sing his own song he's like i fucking hate that song <laughs> but the guy's smart because he presents himself instead of just getting murdered he presents himself, uh, I think he plays to Mick Taylor's loneliness in a way, because he starts like being funny and being witty and like Mick Taylor's like, hey, fuck it, I'm going to have a drink with you, mate. Let's have a drink and sing some songs together before he gets all cuckoo crazy. But it's a really good final guy because he was very, very, very smart. He had to use every ounce of his wit to get out of that situation. And he eventually gets, uh, and using very smart tactics, gets his other hand free, grabs a hammer and then just pops him right in the face with it uh, hard. And you think he escapes. He's <laughs> Mick Taylor's funny as fuck in that scene because he gets up. He's like, oh, I fucking hurt, man. I think he cracked me skull. Uh, but he's actually really fucked up from it. 
And this is where the movie goes into like, oh, this is a sequel, isn't it, territory? Because he starts running through and he's in this giant, gigantic dungeon that that he now owns. Um, like Jason in the reboot, just digging tunnels. But these giant, elaborate tunnels, like in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 that, that Mick Taylor has going on. And there's just dead bodies everywhere, like the cathedral from Jeepers Creepers almost. I mean, around every corner, there's women, men, children, mostly women, uh, just decomposing maggots, disgusting stuff. And he's walking in the back and you can hear him talk and he's like, they all thought and deserved it. And it's just, it's a creepy ass scene, but it's like, they really kill. They, these are like fresh bodies. One of them still alive, very barbarian, scares the shit out of you. Um, but it's very, very like, come on. I don't think he's, he's not doing these numbers in the middle of the outback of Australia, guys. He's doing a little too much here, but it was still entertaining. And then in this fucked up scene, he sees light and he sees you know, his, his exit strategy. It's like right there. But then that girl who was dead pops back up and you realize that this thing's booby trapped to the fucking high heavens after he releases dogs. He's got it all covered. I mean, he's fucking a to Z tip top. Like John Taffer could walk in there and be like, I don't see any problem with this place. You consider your bar rescued. It's a crazy scene because you're like, Oh, you're fucked now. How are you going to get out of this? There's goddamn wooden stakes in the, these stakes in the ground, like booby traps and, and, and just really fucked up moral combat shit going on. And he grabs him and he gives him one last bit of dialogue. And you're like, Oh, so the entire movie has you wondering, is he going to survive or are they going to go the full meanness route and, and have him murdered in a heinous way? So it really puts you on the edge of your seat. It's super suspenseful in that way. And he just, he gives him the speech about how people like me eat people like you and we shit him out for breakfast. So even though he was impressed with him, and he even fucks with him at one point and goes and gets a dress. He's like, you fucked up my, uh, basically my piece of ass that I was going to have. Uh, you fucked that up for me. Now you're going to have to be my entertainment. And this really just fucked up scene where he grabs a dress and you're like, I don't know how dark this is going to go, but anything could happen. That guy's getting butt fucked probably with a knife. But he's like, uh, people like me, you know, eat pieces of shit like you for breakfast. He's like, you eat pieces of shit for breakfast? <laughs> That's not really what he said. But And he's like, I'm the winner and you're the loser. But before he says it, everything goes to black. And then, boom, into the fucking movie. It doesn't just in there, but he wakes up in, in public on the side of the street holding a piece of paper that says loser on it. And these cops come up to him and he's covered in blood. His fingers are cut off. And the the... Text just comes up and it's like, hey, this guy, they found this guy there. Nobody believed his story about this dude with this murder tunnel. And actually they investigated him for a lot of the, the disappearances of other people that were going on. And it was a lengthy battle and he ended up fucking nut can crazy and in a mental asylum because of it. And that was the end. And it leaves you with the big question of why did John, why did Mick Taylor let him go? Why did he let him go? Um, why does he never let anybody go? And there's, there's, there's theories out there. Like he wanted him to share the story about him, uh, to really make people scared because he didn't, he hated tourists. I don't believe that because he wants tourists because they give him people to kill and people to, to, you know, uh, rape and murder and all this shit like that. So, and also part of the reason he was chasing him down so hard is because he was a witness to the crimes he committed. So I don't think it was that, uh, the best I can think is that he actually liked him. You know, I think he was impressed by him. I think he he actually he he liked him and you know, uh he did say he was going to keep his word and let him go if he got those answers right, but he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who actually gives a shit about that. Um so I don't know, it's hard to tell. What do you guys think if you watch this? Why do you think he let him go? Cuz I'm not really sure. And at first I was like, ah, fucking stupid ending, but now I'm like, you know, that was kind of the only logical place that they could go that didn't surprise us. If he escaped, not surprising if uh, Gerard killed him. Wouldn't have been surprising. That was actually surprising. So they really did it well there. I would love to see Wolf Creek 3. I really would. And there's talks of it happening. I hope it does happen. These movies are fucked up, but they're also really smart. And the action scenes are just shot so well in this and, and practical. And just like, this is an underrated uh, movie as far as action goes, too. And it's really fucked up and dark and twisted. I honestly give this one... Um, uh, I'll probably give this movie an 8.5. I don't remember what I got, gave the last one, but I do like this one better. It's more action-packed. It's more entertaining. And it has all the all the meanness and all the shit you want. It's not missing barely anything the first movie had. So I did enjoy this one more. What do you guys think? And um, what franchise should we go to next? Let me know. Comment down below. I love your all's fucking faces. Please click the subscribe button and the bell so that... 
you know when we make these so that we can do this together often. Get inside of each other. Uh, heart and soul is what I meant, you fucking perverts. Halloween never ends, suck my fucking dick, and I don't really care what Blumhouse fucking says. Put him in a box, or suck a fucking cock. You can say he's dead, but we all know he's not. Yeah. So let's go trick or treating, let's go fucking drinking, let's all go in pumpkin head on VHS, cause Halloween never ends.